All right, so speaking of messes. Um, oh, no. Look, I, I told you guys. Your people huh, from Monmouth. Let me tell you something. Illinois, home of Wyatt Earp. I told you guys that if the Bears could have played a game and gone to Arizona and played the Cardinals on Monday or Tuesday, they would have. You did. Because they need to rid themselves of whatever the hell that vomiting, defecating clown show was at Dang. the end of that game against the Washington Commanders. Dang. They need to rid themselves of that, get that stench off them, and go play another game and try and win another game just to get as far away from that experience. It, w- it went from such a feel-good situation to the triumphant return of, oh. of Caleb Williams back to the district where he's from. And by the way, Caleb Williams in that fourth game, quarter game played winning, great. Game-winning drive to take the lead. Like, they, they struggled all game, and then the fourth quarter came around, and he was dealing. Like, he had no time virtually. Like, he missed some throws, obviously, but they couldn't keep him upright. He was scrambling for his life. And then the fourth quarter came around, and it was like, okay, now it's about talent and willing my team to win. And that guy was making play after play after play. Had him in line to win a game. They had then, the game won. Yeah. Like, of course. Had, the game was won. And so now, a tale of two teams, Washington's like, all right, we're, we're good to go. We're sitting at, what, six and two? Uh, the Bears are sitting at four and three. They, they could have both been sitting at, at, at five and two or whatever it was, uh, or, or five, five and, and three. three. And so you, you look at the situation, or the Bears would have gone to five and two, yeah, and now they're yeah, sitting yeah. at four and three. Mm-hmm. And so you look at the situation, you go, all right, so – what exactly happened, not just on that play, but throughout the course of the game? And one of the moments that people are still scratching their heads at is the Bears had a third and goal and gave down it to the, 12-7 to, gave seven it to the lineman. and went fullback dive to a guy by the name of Doug Kramer, who's an offensive lineman who had never rushed the football in his entire career. And, of course – there was a fumble, and Washington recovered. The up top, failed. Oh my God! Hey, your boy ain't here to give you the. No. Q ain't here to give you the no. up top, but up top on up top on that one. And so they, because you know the fridge, he successfully was of doing. Of course, it, you know what I mean. Yeah, but he ain't the fridge. And <laughs> so you're looking. They were trying to recreate it though. In, in that spot, you're thinking like, why the play call? And they've been, you know, the offensive coordinator Shane Waldron defended the play. Go well, it just didn't work out. No, clearly. And then Matt Eberflus, kind of the head coach, defended the play call. Well, DJ Moore was openly critical of the play call. And apparently Matt Eberflus and him had a conversation about it. And DJ Moore got, you know, listen, we're all clear here. I, I get what you're putting down. I don't feel any regret about it. We all talked about it, and uh, me and Flus talked about it with the captains. And just got to stay in house next time. I'm not going to say sorry for what I said, but at the same time, it it is. Uh, it should have just stayed in house, but I said what I said. That's a. Oh, there you go. <laughs> yeah, you know what that is, though? That's a. Yeah, it was a terrible idea. And I'm sorry, we can have this conversation with the coach all we want, but that's a terrible idea. And then you get these other reports that come out that at the start of the year, they, you know how, uh, like, you were an offensive coordinator before. Yeah. Like, you guys had, like, scripted plays to start Absolutely. out the game, right? Mm-hmm. Like, that's – everybody does that. Go off the script. Yeah. You know who didn't? <laughs> the Bears. <laughs> They're like, well, we had, like, plays that we're, we were kind of going to go to, but, you know, not exactly a script. And then finally, DJ Moore and some others got with the coaching staff and were like, hey uh, – Can we get on script? Yeah, can we, like, know what we're doing? And like it's just ten the, play. Like, but you've got now. So, so now this is multiple times through the first two months of the season that they're openly questioning the coaching staff, play calling decisions, strategies. Like Caleb Williams, like lost in the shuffle of that hail mary was he? Like you, you can see Caleb Williams pulling Matt Eberflus off the field. Because Matt Eberflus had had walked onto the field, and they asked Caleb Williams about it, and they're like, "Yeah, so what? What was going on there?" He's like, "Well, I, I didn't want to get penalized and give them more free yardage because we already did that the play before when we didn't do anything about that little quick out that Terry McLaurin ran." And so, like, this is over and over and over again. Lafar, two months in, if this is happening this much, what are we talking about here? Like there's no way that there's that there's confidence in the coaching staff if the players feel like they've got enough 
power and enough say so to be like, no, 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 no. If this is what's coming to the surface, I can't imagine what it's like behind the scenes there. Well, what's interesting is is that we live in a day and age where the athlete is is unafraid. You know, these used to be taboo, like no nos. If if you ever heard anything come from a player about the team, about the coach, anything internal, chances were they would get cut. And and if it was a big name guy, it would create a whole lot of static within within the team, within the team ranks. And maybe that's still how it is. I don't know. It just seems as though that there is more of of a freeness. And I think it's because of technology. I think it's because of social media. I think it's because of where the priorities of of how we communicate and the new ways of how we connect and communicate to our fan bases, uh, I think that plays a large part of it. Traditional media uh, is not traditional media so much anymore. It's not the main sources of the way you uh, kind of consume your information. And so athletes have become more maybe it's entitled with, with how they approach things and how they say things and how they do things. And I don't know that you can – create an environment where the repercussions of it are 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 strong enough because most of the people that are doing this are big name players so you can't you can't how are you going to really adjust and adapt how this the player is evolving with how they communicate with what's going on it's it's just very difficult like you go from a day and age where if you said something it now goes to the local media, right? Generally, it didn't go to the national media until it was you got an OS like, oh, did that really happen? Did he really say that from the local media, right? And then now it comes out the way that it's it's presented by local media, whether it's a writer for the for the local paper or whether it is a reporter for the local you know television reports. That's like you're at the mercy of what those reporters report. And that's how you're going to be portrayed. So if he said something like that, that's going to be brought up to the coach before it even generally hits the public for consumption. There's going to be a conversation, da-da-da. They're still going to release it, but they're going to release it with the spin of what they're, they're going to release the story on on how they're reporting it. Now it's just raw and un cut like i'll go to my social media i'll talk about it on my live oh, i'll no do filter there's, there's no filter bro yeah. and it's totally changed the way that that the fan is able to to consume the information it's totally changed how the athlete does it so i'm not really sure how that that works like openly criticizing your coaches openly criticizing your team oh like aaron Rodgers does it every week he does it every week i mean whether he's criticizing himself included, he does it every single week. It, like, here's what I'm curious about: is if you've got players who are captains, leaders that are publicly giving the side eye to the coaching staff, that coach is done, and then being told by the coach, "Hey, we need to keep that in house," and then doubling down. But afterwards, I meant what I said. <laughs> like, what the hell is the conversation like behind that those coach, doors? Bruh, that coach is on. He's on the clock. That's what I'm saying. When you like, lose, when you lose a locker room, you're on the clock because how how do you coach if you don't have any more control over your locker room than that? Where players feel the the freedom and they feel the comfort and the ease of being able to say what they feel as it applies to something that could be derogatory towards your team, towards your you as a coach, you don't – and that's a leader saying it. You don't have the locker room anymore. That, that's what I'm saying. Like, and it's, it's not, not – You're not in a good position. And if you ever, like, followed like, DJ Moore's career, he's not one of these guys that normally, like, complains about anything or, like, it, goes – It probably like, really doesn't – guy. It probably doesn't need to be viewed as a malicious – way of how he approached it he just said what he felt he just said what he felt I mean we saw that take place with Seattle when they didn't give Marshawn Lynch the ball right I mean 
and they try to throw it and, and end up losing the Super Bowl. You'll see guys have criticisms. Sometimes it's malicious. Sometimes it's not. In this case, I don't, you know, I don't know. I don't know how he feels about, you know, his coach, his coaching staff, his offense coordinator, his head coach. I don't know how how yes. Moore feels about him. But I do know when you lose a game like that, you're going to feel the pressure because it's a large market team. You're going to feel the pressure of everything that took place, and you're also going to have to navigate the feelings of what that looks like going into the next game. And, for and I mean, having a bye week doesn't help, as you mentioned, but with that being said, either you're pulling together to try to go in the right direction to win games or you're pulling further apart and it's like more self-preservation. You you never want, as a coach, you never want a team to go into self-preservation mode because now that's – it's like if you think about – I said this earlier, like you got to get all these guys going in the right direction. It's like a school of fish, right? If you're running a, a good – a good program and you're going in the right direction, you have all the fish in the school going in the same direction. They're going same place, same place, same place. Like you see orca whales going into their pods, going in the same direction. You see dolphins going in the same direction. But if they start going in all kinds of different directions and there's no type of order or anything like that, it's just all out of whack and you don't get the same results. And that's that to me – it's it's like the beginning of the end. If, if if your school of fish ain't going in the same direction, they start don't going in every which direction. It's the beginning of the end of your tenure as the head coach. There, it, it was like man, like they're cruising, like like they're in a plane and they're just cruising and everything's fine. And then all of a sudden, turbulence a, a, just a, hit them bad. A flock of birds just flew into one of the engines. Mm. Like oh boy. We're going down. <laughs> oh, boy. And you realize Sully's not flying the plane. You're like, yeah, we don't know how this is going to turn out. We've it's- lost engine one. <laughs> like, We've lost engine uh, one. Man, that, like, that play, that one play in that game could be the tipping point uh, for uh, for the end of the road there. It first. could have been a heartbreaking play, you know, I th- but it was so many, like the like you said, the, the offensive lineman oh, fumbling, God. bad. The dude sitting there heckling the fans and and key keying while the play goes, and then he's the one that tips the ball into the the receiver's hand to win the game. Bad. It's just the manner, the style points of which they went out <laughs> and lost that game, is what makes it so easy to jump on and make it bad. Yeah. So they got to win, man. Because if they lose, you're you're right. You you know those voices begin to get a little little louder. Yeah, not great.